right. So we saw the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. Okay. And if you guys recall, what was the one other thing besides Paul letters and Jesus letters? What's the one other thing that I keep bringing up that I think matches these stories? Remember something in Matthew 13? What was it? Parables. The parables, right? So we had the parable last time or whenever we reviewed the church of Ephesus of the sower sowing the seed, right? And the seed, some of it fell on the wayside. The birds came and gobbled it up. Some fell in the shallow dirt on rocky ground. Others fell in good dirt, but it was surrounded with thorns and others fell on good dirt and actually didn't have thorns around it. And there was a variety of outcomes for that. So now we're going to get to this parable that I believe is associated with the persecuted church, the church of Philippi and its counterpart, the church of Smyrna. So this parable is called the parable of the tares and of the wheat. Okay. So this is another parable. Give me one sec. Let me set up. Somebody's joining us. See if it'll work for him. Okay. All right. So um, whenever we're talking about the parable of the tares and the wheat, this is another parable that's sowed, it seems to be, by Jesus Christ. So we remember from the first parable that uh, Jesus sowed, and this, what he sowed, right, was the word. That was, was the seed that was being sowed. The seed was the word of God. That was in the first parable of the sower that we talked about before. Now we have the same sower, but he's no longer sowing the word of God. We're going to find in this parable He's sowing the children of the kingdom. That's actually what's being sowed. So we're going to see seed. We're going to see something that's a little different. So let's take a look at the parable itself. This is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. So he says in Matthew 13, verse 24, he says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. The seed already is good. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we should go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So now we see that if this is representing a church, okay, we see that this church is near and dear to the sower's heart. He planted it again, personally. He planted it, he cared for it. And every single seed that was planted, not only was the seed good, the ground was good. Remember that first parable of the sower, there was some ground that was questionable where the seeds just fell off. But this one, the seeds were all good, the ground was all good, right? And he cared for it, he wanted to see it there. So the seed is the people. So in Matthew 13, verse 36, they asked him to explain this parable. So in Matthew 13, 36, he says, Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answers and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So now we have a field of believers. This is no longer Jesus spreading the word of God. He's spreading his servants into the world, right? That's what Jesus said. No false converts here. No people that listened to the word but never accepted it. These are all the children of the kingdom, right? So nobody, Satan can't steal away the word from any of these people. None of them are going to burn in the heat of the day. Remember in that first parable, when certain ones sprung up that had no root, they burned as soon as trial and tribulation showed up. Not these folks. They're all in the good dirt. They were good seed in a good field. But do you think Satan's just going to ignore you because you're saved? Is that what's going to happen? Oh, well, they're saved. I can just let them live a happy life. Just like he left Job alone, right? All right? That's not quite how that worked. So um, he's not going to ignore them. In Matthew 13, 38, it says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares, the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. 
The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. So Satan sees the good seeds. He knows he can't steal the word from them. Because why? Because they have good deep roots. So what can he do? Well, I just want to cause them pain and suffering and try to get them to be unfruitful. Remember old Lot, our buddy Lot? Remember where he was? He was, you know, according to the Bible, a faithful man. But he was surrounded by a wicked world. And whenever we were looking for fruit from him, Abraham tried to say, well, surely he's been fruitful somewhat. He's got 50 people saved. Uh, maybe 40. Oh, let's just go 30, 20, 10. Come on, 10. He's been there for a while now. Surely he's got 10. He's got two to four daughters, depending on how you read it. But no, not even 10 were there. Okay. So this, so this enemy shows up and he goes and he sows all these tares. And the servants of the sower, who's Jesus, come up and say, hey, you sowed good seed. Where did all this bad stuff come from? Do you want me? Do you want us to go and remove all of this source of suffering for these good seeds, all these tears? But what does Jesus say? He says, "Don't don't touch them. Leave them there. I want these to be fruitful, and this is going to make them fruitful." What's he say in Matthew thirteen twenty seven? So the servants of the householder came unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow the good seed in the field? From whence hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go up and gather them up? And he said, nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So Jesus is arguing here to remove the cause of the suffering of his wheat to remove those tares that are taking up those nutrients that are opposing them at every turn, you will damage the fruitfulness of the harvest. Leave the suffering there. It'll make them more fruitful. The wheat will be much more productive if those oppressive tares remain with them. But don't worry, when the harvest is complete, we will pluck and separate every single one of them. There'll be none left in the wrong spot. So Matthew 13 40 says, as therefore he, the tares were gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. Verse 42 says, and he shall cast them into the furnace of fire, where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And guess what phrase he uses? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear right? Jesus likes that phrase, doesn't he? So notice where are the righteous taken, by the way? Where are they gathered? Are they gathered into his home? To his barn, right? So they're not, so if anybody ever says, well, you're born in a barn, say no, but I may end up there if I'm suffering, right? But no, so they're brought to, they're not bothers to the father's house immediately. Instead, they're put into a, you're stored until the appointed time. Barns are where you put things till you need them, right? Matthew 13, 30 says, let both grow together into the harvest. But the time of the harvest, I'll say to my reapers, gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. There's a whole lot you can take away from this parable. It's useful in many ways, not just for a suffering church. It's useful to show us for us today, right? We're surrounded by people that hate Christianity, not just here, but around the world. Some people have it far worse than we have it here. And we see that that suffering can make us much more fruitful, right? And we see that at the end of the world, especially even at the second coming of Christ, we hear about the separation of the sheep and the goats. We can see echoes of that here, where, you know, those who are at his right side, the sheep, he says, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world, from the foundation of the world. And he tells to the goats, go, you depart me, workers of iniquity. And of course, they're cast into a place of suffering, right? So we can take all things about it. But what were the basic themes for the church of Philippi and the basic theme for the church of Smyrna? Well, you're going to see this church that's persecuted, overwhelmed by who? Those who follow Satan, those of the synagogue of Satan, those who are falsely religious people, so-called, right? So in this parable, the, ch the good seed, children of the kingdom, saved people, they're not good or bad ground. They're all solid and they all produce fruit. 
all of them, that they're sabotaged and they're surrounded by their enemy and their enemy is Satan. It's him and his work. When, when wheat and tares first grow, they look identical. You actually can't tell which is which, okay? Um, only at harvest season, whenever you can see the fruit, can you actually tell the difference. So Jesus didn't want them to rescue them because you could destroy the fruitfulness of the wheat. So suffer with the tares, deal with the tares. But despite your suffering, you are going to be shined in the light at the end. At the end, you will shine, as the Bible says in, uh, uh, let me see where it was, for verse 43 of Matthew 13. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So they suffer, but they're going to be fruitful. They're going to be gathered to Jesus. And interestingly, they'll be put in the barn. Not really a clear thing to build a doctrine on, but it's almost like this parable talks about a church that will have to be set aside till the rest of the church comes to join them. Almost like they're going to be killed off if we were to take it to that extreme. But that doesn't mean you see the idea here kind of follows along with the church of Philippi and with a little we've read so far of the church of Smyrna. Okay, does anyone have any questions before we take a little five minute break? Any thoughts, any comments? All right, we'll stop there.